Good morning, family. How are you? This is Pastor Khalil Rogers. Thank you once again for joining us on this Sunday morning. Um, <clears throat> it is Father's Day today, so uh, before we get started, I just want to give a shout out to all of the dads out there, all of the fathers, um, you know, the, the, the fathers, grandfathers, big brothers, mentors, uncles, um, old heads, you know, pop-pops, everybody, big papa, whatever it is you go by, if you are a man who looks after and takes care of children, if you are a caretaker of children, you're a man, you're a father, whether they are biologically yours or not. So we got some block captains uh, in the hood that look after all of them young boys on the block, look after all the young people, make sure they safe, make sure they go to school, make sure they, you know, got what it is that, it, that they need. Um, you, you are a father. If you are involved in some young person's life uh, through mentorship, uh, coaching, whatever it is, you are a father. So I just want to give a shout out to all of the dads out there. I salute you, brothers. I salute you, my kings, um, because fatherhood is needed. We need some biblical masculinity in our streets. Uh, now more than ever, we need biblical, not toxic, Biblical masculinity. Biblical masculinity is never toxic because it comes from God. So we need some biblical masculinity in our streets today. And so I just want to give a shout out to all of the dads out there. It's also Youth Sunday. So I want to give a shout out to um, our young people for doing their thing, even in the midst of this chaos, um, in the midst of a pandemic. And the past 17, 18 months have been some of the roughest that our arguably our in our lifetime definitely but that that the world has ever seen and so um but our young people have still um achieved and they have have done some amazing things and i want to give a shout out to a few of them um first is uh kamara morgan um kamara morgan she uh graduated from high school and so we want to celebrate her and thank god for her she is all on her way to college uh this fall um also brianna hyman we know that she got honor roll again. These are repeat offenders. These are, you know, these kids, they're always doing great in school. And so we just thank God for them. Uh, also, Anaya, little Anaya, she got a uh, healer's daughter. She got straight A's on her report card. So shout out to you, Anaya. And also to my children, I want to give uh, some shout outs to my, my children. Both of them did very well in their report cards, but I want to share some special stuff with you. My daughter, Talia, she received several certificates of honors uh, first for her STEM uh, in school. She's very smart with math and science and all of that. And so it says uh, a certificate of honor for Talia Rogers as an acknowledgement of your outstanding achievement in STEM at Abington Junior High School. We congratulate you and uh, have confidence that your future will be equally successful. Um, and it's signed by the assistant principal and the principal. Um, she also received the certificate of honors for her acknowledgement of outstanding achievement in reading um, at Abington, same situation. And then she also got um, a certificate of recognition that certifies Talia Rogers has been awarded the certificate for uh, the PTO award. So she got like distinguished honors and all of these different leadership qualifications. I mean, she just, she just doing her thing. I don't even know what all this stuff means, but I know it's better than I ever did. And so I thank God for my daughter, um, Talia Rogers, for doing so well in school. And also my son, my son, uh, Khalil Rogers, uh, Deuce, little Deuce, he, he's doing well. He got a distinguished dragon. The dragon is the, the mascot of their school, um, the, the dragons, that's what they call themselves. But he got the Distinguished Dragon Award. Khalil Rogers earned the Distinguished Dragon Award for demonstrating positive Heart uh, behavior. Heart is an acronym for their school. Um, I don't know what all uh, acronyms mean. It's like humility, encouragement, achievement, recognition, and trust, or something like that. But uh, he he uh, demonstrated positive heart behavior for uh, June 2021, and so we are so proud of you. And this is signed by his teacher, Mrs. Reimer, um, the principal, Dr. Kim, and um, the vice principal, uh, Mr. Howe. And so I thank God for all of our young people. Um, we are so proud of them that, again, in the midst of a pandemic, um, chaos, violence, everything going on, our young people are still achieving. And so celebrate with me today. Thank you. 
And what better way to uh, celebrate Youth Day than on Father's Day? That just how that lines up is just amazing to me. But we want to get right to the text because I got I got I got some stuff I got to cover today. We got to get some stuff off our chest. It's Father's Day. Um, I want to um, take your attention to Matthew chapter seventeen, beginning at verse fourteen. Matthew seventeen, verse fourteen. Hit like and share. We want this to go viral. Hit like and share. Um, Matthew chapter 17, beginning at verse 14. We'll pick back up in series next week. Uh, this is Father's Day, so I want to uh, address some stuff today for, the, for, uh, for all of us, but especially for dads. Matthew chapter 17, verse 14. We've been in this text before, but I want to put a different spin on it. Um, and when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him, saying, Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. Then Jesus answered and said, O faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him and the child was cured from that very hour then the disciples came to jesus privately and said why could we not cast it out so jesus said to them because of your unbelief for surely i say to you that if you um, have faith as a mustard seed you will say to this mountain move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you however this kind does not go out except for prayer and Fasting. That is the word of the Lord is already blessed. I want to tag this text today. A father's faith can move mountains. A father's faith can move mountains. Father, move me out of your way. Hide me behind the cross where Jesus is the center of all attraction. Make me a humble waiter to serve up your bread to your people today. Pray that dads will be encouraged. I pray that moms will be encouraged, but especially give a shout out to our dads today. Um, touch them, infuse them with the light of the Holy Spirit, and more importantly, bless our black men. Uh, today, a world who has considered them cast aside um, and disposable, but they are fearfully and wonderfully made in your image and likeness and in the kingdom black men have value. And so I pray that we would restore the dignity of black men with the gospel of Jesus Christ. Bless us on this Father's Day. Bless me as I preach in Jesus name. Amen. A father's faith <clears throat> can move mountains. Every day in America, we are reminded why we need communities of faith. We are all participants in the social system in which miseducation, poverty, and violence have been spreading. We need to demonstrate our concern for our families, our children, and youth by becoming part of the solution. And if the church does not reach out to our young people, especially those whose families are unable to give them the love, the care, and hope and sense of meaning that they need, who will do it? Unfortunately, many of our congregations have abandoned their communities, especially in inner cities where the ethnic and economic makeup of the population is changing. Instead of extending a welcoming hand to newcomers, many congregations flee to, to the suburbs and minister to an aging congregation, and so they have to close their doors. And it is not only predominantly white churches which have been guilty of this um, and abandoning their communities and relinquishing their responsibility for families, children, and youth. But according to Boston pastor Eugene F. Rivers III, black churches have often failed to connect with youth and respond to inner city needs. Um, if you just look at our communities, how many churches do we have on in just one neighborhood, you could have five or six churches within a, a, a four to five block radius. And what are those churches doing in that community? We got all this violence, all this death chaos going on around us. We see the power of the enemy all around us. Where is the power of God? Well, that needs to be displayed by the church. I say that because I believe that the church is the only organization in the neighborhood with a spiritual and moral stature to speak out against miseducation, poverty, racism, police brutality, systemic injustice, and violence effectively. The church is the only institution left with the potential to actually help. We don't have all of the answers to destroy the demons that torment our family, our children, and our youth, but communities of faith can offer spiritual values 
a reason to live uh, rather than to flirt with death. Uh, we can give them a sense of their own value, love, hope, and a call to serve others. Programs designed to deal with violence which lack these qualities will not succeed. Young people need to be and they need to feel loved. They need a cause greater than themselves to which to dedicate their lives and they need hope. For the sake of context, uh, this passage is all about preparation for service in the kingdom of God. The disciples had just seen a preview of Christ coming in power and glory. Malachi had prophesied that Elijah must come prior to the Messiah's coming. You see that in Malachi chapter four. So the disciples asked Jesus about this. The Lord agreed that indeed Elijah had to come first as a reformer, but explained that Elijah had already come. He was referring to his cousin, John the Baptist in verse 13. John was not Elijah, according to John chapter 121, but had come in the spirit of Elijah, according to Luke 1, 17. Had Israel accepted John and his message, he would have fulfilled the role prophesied of Elijah in Matthew chapter 11, verse 14. However, the nation did not recognize the significance of John's mission and treated him however they wanted. John's death was an advanced token of what they would do to Jesus. They rejected the forerunner. They would also reject the king. When Jesus explained this, the disciples realized he was referring to John the Baptist. And because life is not a total mountaintop experience, after moments of spiritual exhilaration come hours of days of toil and expense. The time comes when we must leave the mountain to minister in the valley. It's right there in the text in verse 14. And when they had come to the multitude, a man came to him, kneeling down to him and saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. For he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. So I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. The first thing I see in the text is that mercy is salt. Mercy is salt. At the base of the mountain, a distraught father is waiting not for a politician. He's waiting not for a preacher. He is waiting not for money, power, or status. He is waiting for Jesus. Kneeling down, falling down in supplication before Jesus the Messiah with a passionate plea that his demon-possessed son might be healed. The son suffered from violent epileptic seizures from which sometimes caused him to fall um, into fire and often in to water. This, this term epileptic or epilepsy here is to be moonstruck. It's really to be a lunatic. It's to be crazy. It has to do with someone being afflicted by a demonic presence or an unclean spirit. The symptoms would become more aggressive during certain lunar periods, foaming at the mouth, acting crazy, similar to a werewolf when the moon is full. Luke chapter 9 verse 39 says, and a spirit seizes him and he suddenly screams and it throws him into a convulsion with foaming at the mouth and only with difficulty does it leave him mauling him as it leaves. This demon is tormenting this young man. He says, Lord, have mercy on my son. And, 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 and there are plenty of brothers today who are still saying, Lord, have mercy on my son. Lord, have mercy on my child. They're out there running the streets reckless. Have mercy on them. They're failing are the grades in school. Lord, have mercy on them. They, they, they got caught up in an opioid addiction. Lord, have mercy on my son. They, they, they choosing the gang life over righteousness. Lord, have mercy on my child. Mercy is, is to show compassion. That, in other words, don't just feel sorry for me, but be active in delivering my son. And I'm glad that the brother says that because some folks will feel sorry for your condition, but won't do a thing to help you while you suffer from that condition. He says, Lord, do for my son what you've done for other folks. If I could use my theological imagination, he says, Lord, do for my son like you did with the demoniac and Capernaum 
Son of God in Mark chapter 1. Lord, do for my son like you did for the man, both blind and dumb in Matthew 12. Lord, do for my son like you did the two demoniacs at Gadara in Matthew chapter 8. Lord, do for my son like you did the man with a dumb spirit in Matthew 9. Lord, do for my son like you did the Syrophoenician's daughter in Matthew 15. Lord, do for my son like you did Jairus' daughter in Luke chapter 8. Lord, do for my son like you did with the woman with the issue of blood. Lord, do for my son like you've done for other folks. Jesus is moved with compassion. He says, Lord, remove my misery. Lord, have mercy on my son, for he is an epileptic and suffers severely, for he often falls into the fire and often into the water. The, the, the demon that was possessing this young man would, would throw the boy in the fire to burn him and then throw him into the water in an attempt to drown him. Ah, uh, I, 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 I hate to tell you this. I hate to scare you. I don't want to scare you, but I got to tell you the truth, family. The devil literally wants to murder our children. That's right. The devil literally wants to murder our children. Let me prove it to you. Since 2013, there had been over 400 incidents in which a gun was discharged on a school campus in America. Just this year alone, just 2021 alone, six months into the new year, and at least 30 incidents of gunfire happened on school grounds, resulting in nine deaths and 11 injuries nationally. The devil wants to murder our children. Why do you think every single day you turn on the, the, the evening news, you hear about murder and mayhem and rape and robbery and drugs and violence and all kind of things going on involving our young people because the devil wants to murder our children. And I'm all up in the Bible for the Bible says the thief, that's the devil, comes, uh, does not come except to steal, kill and destroy. But I have come that you may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. John 10 verse 10. The misery was compounded by burns and mere drownings that this young man was suffering. This this young man, this child uh, was a classic example of the suffering caused by Satan, the cruelest of all slave masters. Slavery, bondage, and oppression are all instruments of the enemy. This man is crying out to Jesus saying, move with compassion, remove my misery because man can't help me. He says, man can't help me. It's right there in verse 16. He said, so I brought him to your disciples, but they could not cure him. I, I brought him to the church, but the church couldn't do nothing with him. I, I brought him to the pastor, but the pastor couldn't do nothing with him. I brought him to the deacon, and the deacon couldn't do nothing with him. So I brought him to the church mother, and the church mother couldn't do nothing with him. Brought him to the head of the choir, and the choir couldn't do nothing with him. So, so I brought him to the trustee who's been at the church for 50 years, and, and he and she couldn't do nothing with him. So I brought him to the church administrator, and the, to, uh, the, the, the youth pastor, and, the, and the, the, all these folk, the ushers, and, and all these folk, the deaconess. I brought him to all these folk with titles and positions. I brought him to the people with keys to the building and they couldn't do nothing for me. So I'm bringing him to you. Ah, because when you're going through, sometimes man can't help you. You better learn to cry out to Jesus. He says, I brought him to your disciples and they couldn't cure him. Cure here in, in the text is a Greek word uh, where we get our English word therapy. It, it literally means to heal. It's, it's to wait upon. It's to minister to. It's an act of servanthood to go out of one's own way to help someone who's suffering. The father had gone to the disciples for help only to learn that man can't help you when the problem is spiritual. Uh, th this pandemic of gun violence and racism going on in our nation isn't a natural problem. So natural solutions won't solve it. 
There are no natural solutions for spiritual problems. Let me say that again. There are no natural solutions for spiritual problems. Let's say that one more time. There are no natural solutions for spiritual problems. You can't vote your way out of this one. You, 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 you can't, <laughs> you can't fist fight your way out of this one. You can't gun blaze your way out of this one. That there are no natural, you can't cuss somebody out your way out of this one. There are no natural solutions for spiritual problems. This is spiritual warfare. The stuff that's going on in our streets is spiritual. So we need a spiritual response to this madness. Therefore, it's going to take some spiritual people with a whole lot of faith to work together, put aside our little petty differences, put aside our little petty cliques. Those are called denominations. Put them aside and work together to solve the problem that ails all of us. The disciples had been powerless because of their faithlessness to cure this boy. We don't know much about this father other than he cared for his son and wanted his suffering to end. No good parent wants to watch their child suffer. So being at his wit's end, he's doing the only thing he could do, which is to cry out to Jesus for help. And I'd get a brother credit because he had enough faith to cry out to Jesus on behalf of his son. He doesn't try to solve the problem himself like many men do. See, many, many of us, I'm talking about men, this Father's Day, many of us are, are so prideful, we're ashamed to cry out for help. Brother, let me tell you something. Let me tell you something, man. Let me tell you something, black man. Crying out to God for help is the manliest thing you can do. I'm going to say that again. Let me tell you something, man. I'm talking to men. Crying out to God for help is the manliest thing you can do. Now, I wonder if his son hadn't been going through, would he have sought Jesus? Would, would he have come looking for Jesus if, if he didn't have a problem? <laughs> do, do we look for Jesus when we ain't got a problem? Do, do we just stop by to say, Lord, I just wanted to say good morning. I, I just wanted to say thank you for what you already did. Have done. I just wanted to say thank you for waking me up this morning. Or, or do we only call on Jesus when we're going through? See, none of us like suffering, but sometimes God allows us to suffer because uh, it's in our suffering that we become more like Christ. Ah, let me say that again. None of us like to suffer. I know I don't. But sometimes it's through the suffering that we become more like Christ. And that's God's ultimate goal for all of us is to be like Jesus Christ. Let me prove it to you. Suffering destroys the illusion of self-sufficiency and keeps us totally dependent on God. You find that in Deuteronomy 8. Suffering also teaches us to pray. We find that in Acts chapter 12. Suffering causes us to study the Bible. We find that in Psalm 119. Suffering makes us sympathetic and gives us credibility in ministry to others. You find that in 2 Corinthians 1. Suffering draws family and friends together, Romans 12. Suffering corrects priorities, causing us to distinguish the eternal from the transitory, the important from the non-important, 2 Corinthians 4. Suffering enables us to glorify God by increased witness to believers and non-believers. John chapter 9. Suffering can lead to salvation for the afflicted or for others who wouldn't have listened to the gospel in any other way. Luke chapter 15. Suffering deepens our understanding of God's character. Matthew chapter 11. Suffering teaches us the sanctity of human life. Matthew chapter 25. Suffering causes us to appreciate God's blessing. Psalm 103. Suffering tests our loyalty and faith. Job chapter 1. Suffering can correct our sins to bring us back to God. John chapter 5. Suffering causes us to appreciate God's strength and wisdom by contrast to our own limitations. Isaiah chapter 40. Suffering uh, creates great endurance and, and builds our patience and character. James chapter 1. Suffering is a part of the mysterious process towards Christ because Christ had to first suffer before he could enter into glory. Luke chapter 24, Romans chapter 8, and 1 Peter chapter 2. The seasoned saints used to sing a song, no cross, no crown. Sometimes God allows for us to go through some stuff just to draw us closer to him. So we see mercy is sought. But secondly, we also see that the Messiah takes matters in his own hands. 
the Messiah takes matters into his own hands. Verse 17, then Jesus answered and said, oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon and it came out of him. And the child was cured that very hour. That, that means instantly he, he was cured. Um, see, Jesus is, is looking for people who recognize the divine presence of God. And I say that because he uses this word in verse 17. It's an interesting word, faithless. These are people who have no confidence in the only one they should have confidence in. These are folk who, who, who put in their trust in everything else except the one person, Jesus Christ, who they should be putting their trust in. Now, some theologians believe that Jesus is addressing the disciples here. Others believe he's addressing the crowd, which included the religious people. Um, however, the text doesn't tell us because maybe he's talking to the crowd. Maybe he's talking to the disciples and maybe he's talking to us. If, if Jesus were physically with us today, what would he say to us? Would he be pleased with our faith? Don't answer. Think for yourself. Is he pleased with our faith? Jesus is looking for people of faith. And not just any faith, but a faith that moves mountains. The, the, the faith that fastens itself to the presence of the divine and engages situations from that premise. That's what Jesus is looking for. I know that because he says, oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long should I be with you? How long should I bear with you? In other words, y'all working my nerves with y'all faithlessness. He calls them perverse uh, perversion, anything that's perverted is twisted. Uh, um, when we call somebody a pervert, that, that's what that means. That means that they are twisted. It's distorted. It's misleading. It's seductive. It's vicious and corrupt. That's what it means, perverse. He calls them a faithless and perverse generation. So he's telling these folk all. Um, generation signifies a race of people living during the same time period. It's society as a whole. So he's not just talking about, you know, millennials or zennials or generation Xers or baby boomers or the builders or whatever the generation you belong to. He's talking about society as a whole. He says, how long should I be present with you? How long should I bear with you? Y'all working my nerves. I'm, I'm sick and tired of being around all of you faithless and twisted people. That's basically what he's saying. Jesus is looking for people who recognize the divine presence of God. Jesus is looking for people who rely on the divine promises of God. Ah. The question is, has the black church, and not even just the black church, has the church as a whole, uh, which has historically stood on the promises of God, have we become the faithless generation? Have we become the faithless generation? Have we looked at the state of our communities and said, yeah, there ain't no hope. We're we going to stop evangelizing. We're just going to go ahead and, you know, and just have church. Just, just have our little country club every week. It, it, ain't, no, it ain't no helping these people. This, this generation is just, it's, it's over. Ain't no hope for them. So, so I ain't spending no time, you know, putting together no ministry to figure out how are we going to reach these people out here? Let God deal with them. We're done. Now, we wouldn't say that <laughs> because the Bible called us to do the exact opposite. It says, go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. So we would never say that we're not being obedient to God's call and command. But that's exactly what we're doing when we're not evangelizing. And maybe the reason we're not evangelizing is because we've become the faithless generation. I'm talking about the church. I'm talking about us in the church. I'm talking about us watching right now. Maybe we become that faithless generation. I'm talking about me. Okay. Uh, have we looked at the state of our communities and said, ain't no hope. It, it's over. It's a wrap. Neither the father, the crowd, or the disciples had the power to heal this boy. Only Jesus did. That's why he's looking for people who recognize the divine presence of God. He's looking for people who rely on the divine promises of God, but he's also looking for people who realize the divine power of God. As soon as the sick boy was brought to him, Jesus rebuked the demon and the boy was instantly cured. Pay attention to how de uh, Jesus deals with demons. He don't, he don't play around with them. He don't box with kid gloves with demons. He rebuked them 
He didn't ask them, hey, could you, would you please, you know, leave the boy alone? Let, let me pray about this first. No, get out of it. This, this is, this is to admonish with urgency. It's a strict, harsh judgment. It's to forbid. In other words, come out of that boy now. And you better not ever enter, in him, enter into him again. That's a rebuke. That's what this means in Greek. The demon is it's an evil spirit. It's it's um, somebody who is under the, the, the authority of Satan. It, it's an unclean demonic spirit that is superior to man, but inferior to God. <laughs> in the synoptic gospels, um, Satan is responsible for a lot of stuff. He's responsible for the temptation of Christ in the wilderness. We see that in Matthew 4. He's the leader of the demonic forces which are able to inflict disease and possess people. Stop saying God made my family sick. God, God does not cause sickness. God does not cause death and evil. That's, God is not doing this stuff that's going on in our world. God is not the one destroying the earth. Satan is. Okay? Let, let's get our theology correct here. Now, God may allow some stuff to happen for his own glory and for his own cause to, to bring out... A greater good that we all we don't always know the answer to why he's allowing it however god does not cause that stuff all right god ain't the one out here killing our young people that's not god that's that's satan doing that we see this in matthew chapter 17 luke chapter 13 and luke 22 paul portrayed satan as the god of this age the god of this world in second corinthians 4 that's why the world is on its way to hell because it belongs to satan meaning he holds the influence even though god is the creator and sustainer satan is the one who holds the influence all right that's who controlling your government that's who controlling your media that's who controlling your schools that's who controlling your police departments that's who controlling your politicians that's who controlling your music your entertainment your tv your <laughs> your fashion satan got all that under wraps he, he is the chief power of the demonic forces, often referred to as the powers of the air, Ephesians 2 and Ephesians 6. In the general epistle, Satan is graphically portrayed as a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour, 1 Peter 5 and 2 Peter chapter 4, um, 2 Peter chapter 2 verse 4 and Jude chapter 1 verse 6 uh, refers to angels who did not keep their place in sin. Those are the demonic hierarchy who followed Satan and was thrown out. A heaven. So now you know what's really going on in our streets. Uh, now you understand that this thing is spiritual warfare. See, see, it's no accident that the prison industrial complex is the cash cow in America. It's no accident that fatherless homes are pervasive in our communities. It's no accident that our people are being oppressed spiritually, mentally, physically, educationally, poli politically, and economically. There is no accident that our nation is written, uh, crime written and plagued with gun violence and racism and classism and imperialism and sexism and, and, and homophobia and every other type of ism you want to think of. We know why. It's spiritual warfare. The Bible says, for we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. Ephesians chapter 6 verse 12. Although the Bible teaches that this world is under the power of Satan, we have to remember that neither he or his demons are on equal footing with God. <laughs> Satan and the demonic hierarchy are creatures. They are created beings who are subject to God's sovereign will. So even though they can tempt you to sin, they can't force you to sin. He can tempt me to sin. He can't force me to sin. Stop saying the devil made me do it. No, he didn't. You chose to do it. He can only dangle the bait. The Bible is clear that Satan and his demonic following have already been judged and decisively defeated by the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That's why we should be preaching the gospel, because that's what defeated Satan. Colossians chapter 1, verse 13, uh, and chapter 2, verse 15. The believers have the armor of Christ as spiritual security to protect us from the demonic attacks and spiritual warfare. So we see in a text that mercy is sought. We see that the Messiah takes matters in his own hands, but we also see that mustard seed faith moves mountains. Mustard seed faith moves mountains. Verse 19, then the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? 
So Jesus said to them, because of your unbelief, for assuredly I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Puzzled by their powerlessness, the disciples privately, they pulled Jesus to the side and asked him for an explanation. And his answer was straightforward and direct. See, we got to, we got to, this hippie Jesus we have created, this Hollywood, you know, light skin, white skin, blonde hair, blue eyed, soft Jesus walking around talking about, oh, peace, peace. That's not the Jesus of the Bible. Throw that Jesus away. He ain't no good for you. We need, to, we need to look at the historical, biblical Jesus. That's what we should be following. Listen to how he answers the disciples when they asked him why they couldn't cast his demon out. He said, because of your unbelief. Straight like that. Verse 20, because of your unbelief, because you got no faith. You're unfaithful. Your faith is weak. Your faith is mediocre. And because it's mediocre faith, it's futile. See, mediocre faith ain't no good. In other words, you haven't trusted in the one you should be relying on. You done put all your trust in them lying politicians. <laughs> you done put all your trust in failing world governments. You done put all your trust in money that's losing its value. That's why they got cryptocurrency now. And when that uh, devalues, they're going to create something else. You done put all your trust in that dead end job. The man got you slaving, running up and down. You working eight days a week, 25 hours a day. <laughs> That's going to hit somebody later. For a job, slaving, you're a wage slave. You done put all your trust in that. You think it's the job that's taking care of you. You done put all your trust in your own education. I got eight degrees running off the wall. You got all them degrees and they got no common sense. You, you done put all your trust in your own abilities. You done put all your trust in that man who ain't no good. You done put all your trust in that woman who ain't no good. You done put all your trust in the deacon. You done put all your trust in that preacher. You done put all your trust in the panel of talking heads on your favorite media outlet, CNN and Fox News. You done put your trust in everything and everybody but God. That's basically what he's saying when he says because of your faithlessness. Your mediocre faith is futile. He says mustard seed faith is what's needed because mustard seed faith is active. For assuredly, this is what he says in the text, I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, what is a mustard seed? It's a small seed found in Middle Eastern and Asian countries, which grows into a large plant, um, usually about 10 to 12 feet. And like a mustard seed, Active faith is faith that is always growing and maturing. It's not dead, useless, or futile. See, this is what he's saying to them. You got to have mustard seed faith, a faith that's always growing. It's always maturing. It's always active. It's never dead. It's never useless or futile. Now, some folk misinterpret this verse because they focus on what others have said about the verse instead of carefully reading it for themselves. I taught y'all for months, how to study your Bible. And the first phase in Bible study is observation, is to read what the text says. Not what you think it says, not what you didn't heard somebody say it says, not what you didn't heard the preacher say it says. What does it say? You got to read it for yourself. That's the only way for you to know. Now, this is what other folks say that this text says. See, Jesus said, all you need is a little bit of faith. Um, not a lot of faith, you just need a little bit of faith and you can move mountains. Repeat after me, that is not what this verse says. That is not what this verse says. It says, if you have faith as a mustard seed, not if you have a little bit of faith. <laughs> See the difference? It changes the entire understanding of the verse. Because the size of the seed isn't important. It's the character or quality of the seed. That matters. What starts out as a small seed grows into a huge tree. This is the illustration Jesus is using for his disciples to understand the principle of faith. Like the mustard seed, our faith starts out small. 
But as we grow and mature in Christ, our faith grows and matures. And eventually it becomes something so big, something so large that others can benefit from. So it's not about the small seed. It's not about the size. It's about the big potential of the seed. Your mediocre faith is futile. Mustard seed faith is active. Jesus says, if you got mustard seed faith, you can move mountains. He says, for surely I say to you, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. I can literally move mountains. Uh, what is he talking about? I can change the location or the condition uh, of my environment. If I had faith as a mustard seed, I, I can I can create space. You talk about God enlarging your territory. Well, God enlarge you too. God enlarge my faith. Uh, because if my faith is enlarged, then my territory is going to follow. It, it's to move from one place to another. He is using a proverbial expression, meaning when you have growing and maturing faith, nothing shall be impossible for you. Stop. Crying about they won't hire me. Won't nobody accept me. I, they won't give me funding. If you got faith the size of a mustard seed, you'll be able to create space for yourself and for others to benefit if you put your trust in him. The disciples had full commission, among other things, to cast out devils without exception. But this devil being so powerful caused the disciples to distrust the power they had received. They thought that the power they had received from God was inferior to the power of the devil that was oppressing this boy. This is why they failed when trying to heal the boy. And Christ shows them what they might have done if they had active and maturing or mustard seed faith. They could have moved mountains, not by themselves, but by God's power. True faith must be based upon some command or promise of God, expecting to perform some spectacular stunt for your own glory is not faith, but it's presumption and arrogance. So that's not what Jesus is talking about here, and neither am I. But if God guides the believer, if he guides the believer in a certain direction or issues a command, the believer can have the utmost confidence that mountainous difficulties will be miraculously moved. Nothing is impossible to those who believe. God can heal our families. God can heal our churches. God can heal our neighborhoods. God can fix our communities. God can heal our city. God can heal our state. God can heal our nation. God can heal our world. That's why you should never underestimate a young person. Never underestimate a young black man. Never give up on a young black woman. Uh, that's why you should never forget about or cast aside or neglect or mistreat a young person for they will grow older and they will remember you. And a and, and young person, young brother, young sister, you shouldn't underestimate, forget about, cast aside, neglect or mistreat yourself or others like you either because nothing is impossible for those who believe. Older brothers, it's our job to teach the younger brothers about what matters. It's our job to teach them how to get to know their creator. It's our job to teach them the roadmap to real and lasting success. It's our job to teach them to tap into that unlimited power on the inside of them. It's our job to teach them the value of reading. It's our job to teach them the importance of increasing their knowledge. It's our job to teach them um, the obstacles of getting a good education. It's our job to teach them the marks of a truly educated man. It's our job to teach them that in all they're getting to get wisdom and get understanding. It is our job to teach them proper etiquette and how they should conduct themselves as God-fearing men. It's our job to teach them that they aren't inferior to nobody. It's our job to teach them to be leaders and to take the road less traveled. It's our job to teach them to take full responsibility for themselves. It's our job to talk 
and to listen to them. It's our job to teach them their history and to let them know where they come from so that they'll know where they're going. It's our job to teach them the value of working hard and working smart. It's our job to teach them the things we wish we knew when we were younger. It's our job to teach them how to be real cool and to have genuine swag and what real drip and floss it looks like. It's our job to teach them how to treat young ladies. It's our job to teach them to think for themselves while it's still legal. It's our job to pull them out of the fire. We see mercy sought. We see the Messiah takes matters in his own hands. We see mustard seed faith moves mountains. And lastly, and I'm out of your way, we see that ministry is motorized by prayer and fasting. Ministry is motorized by prayer and fasting. He says, however, in verse 21, this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. Now, Houston, we got a problem because I know some of y'all like, if you're paying attention, I don't see verse 21 in my Bible. <laughs> Ain't nothing wrong with your Bible. Verse 21 is omitted in many modern translations of the Bible because it is lacking in many early manuscripts. However, it is found in the majority of manuscripts and it fits the context of an especially difficult problem. So if it ain't in your Bible, don't trip out. All right. That, that's that's just that's what's called a modification or an adjustment. Don't don't make a big deal about that. But what is he saying here? Prayer. It has to do with calling on the Lord for assistance and breaking the stronghold of Satan's power. Prayer um, is a powerful weapon. That's why you got to pray for strength to overcome cares and burdens. Pray for the renewing of your mind. You got to pray for conquering your thought life. You got to pray for godly wisdom in the affairs of life. You got to pray for healing of damaged emotions. You got to pray for setting your priorities in order. Pray for being equipped for success. Pray for the success of your career. Pray for the success of your ministry. Pray for spiritual discernment. Pray to know God's will. You got to pray for a peaceful sleep. Pray for victory over pride. Pray to overcome intimidation. Pray for victory over temptation. Pray for your marriage. Pray for your community. Pray for your church. Pray for your pastor. Pray for peace in the family. Pray for the revival of America. Pray for unity and harmony on our streets. Pray for the destruction of racism and injustice. Pray for the school district. Pray for the vision of the church. Pray for the vision of the pastor. Pray for the protection of our children and loved ones. Pray for the protection and deliverance of our city. Pray for for the biblical prosperity, not worldly prosperity, biblical prosperity. Pray for the deliverance of mental disorders. Pray for overcoming negative attitudes. Pray for that rebellious teenager. Pray for that gangbanger. Pray for the dope pusher. Pray for the prostitute. Pray for the homosexual. Pray for the transgender. Pray for the lesbian. Pray for the queer. Pray for the deadbeat dad. Pray for the unloving husband. Pray for the unsubmissive wife. Pray for disobedient children. Pray for God to handle your enemies. The songwriter said, oh, what peace we often forfeit. Oh, what needless pain we bear. All because we do not care. Everything to God in prayer. Some things only come through prayer. But he uses something else. Fasting. Ah, we don't like that one. Some of us don't even pray. <laughs> but we definitely ain't fasting. If, you, if you're not a praying person, you can forget fasting. Because they go hand in hand. You, you can't, you can't, you can... You can, um, you can pray without fasting, but you can't fast without praying. <laughs> what is fasting? Fasting is the spiritual link to the person of Jesus Christ. It is the deliberate abstinence from physical gratification, usually going without food for a period of time, to achieve a greater spiritual goal. Fasting is intentionally denying the flesh in order to gain a response from the spirit. It means renouncing the natural in order to invoke the supernatural. When fasting, you're saying no to yourself and yes to God. Prayer and fasting is powerful. Prayer and fasting is praise. Prayer and fasting is proclamation. You may be wondering why you can't get rid of that devil in your life. That thing that's tormenting you, your family, your children in your community. You've tried everything under the sun and that devil is still here. Coming to church is beneficial, but that alone won't do it. 
Coming to Bible study is beneficial, but that alone won't do it. Joining a ministry is beneficial, but that alone won't do it. Tithing and giving offerings is, is beneficial, but that alone won't do it. Voting is beneficial, but that alone won't do it. Protesting injustice is beneficial, but that alone won't do it. Boycotting oppressive institutions is beneficial, but that alone won't do it. Marching and practicing civil disobedience is beneficial, but that alone won't do it. There are some devils that can only be destroyed by prayer and fasting. Just like you need it, just like you need, and I recommend you get on a prayer schedule. You know, whether it's morning, noon, or night, whether it's like the Islamic brothers and sisters five times a day, we also need a fasting schedule. You know, you don't have to wait until once a year during Lent to fast. <laughs> you know, I uh, generally, the last Wednesday of every month, I generally, unless I, I don't do it, but generally that's the day that I set aside, the last Wednesday of every month, that's the day that I set aside to fast. I Throughout the day, I won't eat any. I'll just drink water, um, you know, or supplements or whatever through, all throughout the day. And I'll eat one meal when the night falls. Um, and throughout that time when I normally would be eating or having lunch or whatever, I'm in my word. I'm praying. I'm, I'm praying for my church. I'm praying for the community. I'm praying for healing of sick loved ones or whatever. You don't have to follow my schedule. That's my schedule. That's what I do. You get your own one. But you need a prayer schedule and a fasting schedule because there are some things that only come through prayer and fasting. So as I close, I just want to tell somebody that Jesus Christ is coming back for a church with a faith that can move mountains. He's not coming back for a church that cowers in fear whenever the devil roars. He's not coming back for a church that is divided by denominations, race, socioeconomic status, or political persuasions. He's coming back for a church that he sanctified and cleansed with the washing of water by the word that he might present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she should be holy and without blemish. He's coming back for the church that he suffered, bled, and died for, but that also early Sunday morning he got up with all power in his hands, declaring that he is Savior and Lord, and that all who believe in him shall have a right to the tree of life. That's the church he's coming back for. So we need a church that has faith that can move mountains. We, we, we need fathers and men. God knows we need fathers and men who, who have faith that will move mountains. That, that's our job, brothers. This stuff going on, this violence in the street, that is, that, I mean, the women too, but that's definitely, that. man, this is on us, man. We dropping the ball out here. We we letting our young boys, we done let them run rampant. We, got, we the ones that got to grip these young boys up. Starting with the ones in our own families, your sons and your nephews and all these other little, little young boys that you know that's out here that's wild. It's our job to be mentoring them and gripping them up and listen and, and teaching them which way to go. We, we cannot lead them to the devices of the streets. We cannot let Satan have our children, man. Got to have some spine. We need men. We need fathers with faith that can move mountains. You may be watching and you don't have any faith at all. At least not in Jesus Christ. And you desperately want to know how you can receive Christ as Savior and Lord of your life. Well, I can lead you to him right now. Bow with me for a word of prayer. I'll introduce you to Christ right now. I'll lead you to him. In fact, I'll lead you to him, and you can meet him for yourself. Believe it in your heart and confess with your mouth that he came, he suffered, he bled, and he died, and he rose again on the third day. Confess him as Lord of your life, and he'll save you right now. So bow with me and repeat after me. Father, I confess. I confess, God, that I'm a sinner. I confess, Lord, that I need you in my life. I haven't made all of the right decisions. I've harmed some people. Some people have harmed me. I've done things I shouldn't have done. I said things I shouldn't have said. And God knows I've thought things I shouldn't have thought. I ask for you to forgive me of my sin. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. I ask you to come into my heart and save me. I believe in your son, Jesus Christ, and his work at Calvary. I get it now. I understand 
why he had to come, suffer, bleed, and die, and rose, rise again on the third day. I understand, because I was born in sin, shaping in iniquity. So the only way that I could have true access to the Father is through him. I get it now, and I believe it. So I ask you to come into my heart and save me. I believe in your son, Jesus Christ, and I confess that I need him. I confess that I need him in my life. Touch me right now, God. Make me the man, the woman, the child you want me to be. For your glory and your honor, in Jesus' name, amen. If you pray that prayer, welcome to the body of Christ. Welcome to the body of Christ. And you're going to need a church home. You can't be out here. You can't be a spiritual hermit. You know, you've just been introduced. You've just been welcomed and adopted into the family of God. And we are a family. And, and, and you can't be out here not knowing who your family is. So you need to be a part of a, a local church. If you're in the Philadelphia area, we offer you the Pinal Baptist Church. Our building is not open right now. It will be soon. However, you don't need to wait for the building to open. Because we still want to be doing this virtually. Even once the building opens back up, we're still going to be doing virtual uh, Sunday morning. So um, you don't have to wait for the building to open back up. All you have to do is go to our website, www.pinalbaptistchurch.org, and uh, send us an email with your contact information and say that you would like to be become a partner of the Pinal Baptist Church. And somebody will contact you within 24 to 48 hours, and we'll get you signed up. For those of you who continue to support our ministry, we thank you so much. For those of you who would like, you can go to that same website and you can click give and you can uh, text to give. You can send your contributions into the church or you can give right on the website. But we thank you so much for those of you who have been so gracious to us. Uh, many churches have lost their buildings in this pandemic and ours are still standing. We haven't missed a beat. And so we thank God uh, for that. I do not take that for granted. We do not take it for granted. And that is all because of your generosity and, you know, um, God, God using you to be a blessing to us so that we continue to do what it is that we do. So we thank God for you. Um, but that's my time for the day, family. I've went way over my time. Um, I pray that you would have a good Father's Day, Dad. Um, spend some time with your children. If you don't have children, spend some time with some young person, um, them young people that you mentor and spend some time with them that day. Um, and uh, spoil, spoil the man today, especially black men and, you know, especially black men. It's few, it's few times in life where a black man gets to be spoiled. It's few, few days where black men get to be spoiled. So spoil, spoil in the day. Um, spoil your father today. Love on him today. Tell him you love him. Give him his flowers while he can still smell them. Don't wait until he's stretched out in front of a co in a coffin at some church or in a funeral home surrounded by a bunch of strangers and people who claim to love him crying and commiserating over the casket saying how much you love them and daddy i love you i miss you don't don't do that then you need to do that while while he's still here and can hear you give him his flowers while he can still smell them so love on your dad today and dad love on your children but happy father's day brothers i love you god bless you god keep you i'll let y'all next week peace